Hello and welcome everyone to our LTS Academy today. My name is Iris Schnitzler and uh, I'm heading the marketing department at LTS. Today we will deal about or we talk, we'll talk about oral thin films, introducing um, oral thin films as a viable dosage form for pain relief. This session or let's let's go and and look uh, and uh, into today's agenda uh, which will be started by Patrick Moore uh, he will talk about our oral thin film technology and then it this session will be followed by Professor Albert Hahn. he will talk about pain and ketamine Florian Hammers will present the results of our esketamine human study and all these three sessions will be followed by Q&A sessions. So whenever you have a question, please um, press the question button on your screen and you can put the, the question in whenever you want. We will add, answer them after the session. Last but not least, we will have May presenting LTS as a company, our corporation models, and also give some insights on the pain and esketamine market. So I would say we should start. We don't have so much time and I, we would start with Patrick. Patrick, uh, you're with LTS since 2006. Uh, you're heading the LTS department um, responsible for our proprietary project. And you are also heading for two years now, our innovation management. So Patrick, we are all looking forward to your introduction into our oral thin film technology. Yeah, thanks Iris for the nice introduction and yeah, warm welcome also from my side to the audience and thanks for joining the LTS Academy. And we now should switch to my presentation. What I would like before starting with the um, yeah, main topic, the ketamine oral thin film, I would like to give you a brief overview of what um, of the, the oral thin film technology itself. And here it is um, about the brief. Uh, or thin film technology itself, which is one of the main, yeah, one of the core technologies of LTS. You see here that we're also um, manufacturing and developing transdermal system and micro array patches, but for today, it's really focusing on all thin films. And the story begins round about back in, in 2000. Um, so all thin films in, in general are just an edible dosage form, really a very thin dosage form which can be placed on the tongue just to be dissolved quite quickly and you use the standard oral route as you do it with, with tablets or capsules. On the other hand, you have the chance to circumvent the uh, gastrointestinal tract by using the transmucosa route of administration. And the main benefit is or one of the main benefits is that you do not need any kind of water to, to dissolve that. It's really just uh, dissolved by the saliva more or less fast. Um, I will talk about that later. Um, and the oral mucosa is, yeah, can be used or cannot be used. So finally, it starts with, with a non-pharmaceutical product. You may know the Listerine pocket packs. Um, which is more or less just a mouth refreshener with different flavors like uh, mint, cinnamon, uh, or similar flavors. And that are manufactured by LTS and still manufactured by LTS now more than 20 years ago. And the same technology can be also used for several APIs. Yeah, but maybe talking about a little bit about the advantages. So why is that a, such a fascinating oral dosage form? On the one hand, you can really play with the absorption kinetics. So that means if you would like to have a CMAX maybe combined with a very fast onset of action, that is possible with an oral thin film. 
On the other hand, by choosing different kind of polymers, you can also more focusing on the area under the curve without having that very fast onset of action, but maybe a slower release in the beginning, but having a broad area under the curve, finally, just depending on your need, on the indication, on the special drug substance. Of course, you can also improve the bioavailability. And you will see that also for the ketamine that uh, that could be achieved in comparison to the oral route of administration. Hepatic first pass effect can also be reduced by circumventing the transmucosal, um, uh, uh, by circumventing the, um, the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and with that, of course, can reduce the dose as not that much dose is needed by using the transmucosal route. Obviously also food effect can be avoided. And it's a really simple way for patients to use the drug. So it's a really an improved compliance. You can just take it with you. You can take one, play it, uh, place it on the tongue or below the tongue, or maybe have a buckle administration and you can swallow it, swallow it quite easily without having um, more or less big tablet or capsule, which is depending on the population, not that easy to, to swallow, thinking about pediatric, pediatric or geriatric populations. Overall, we're talking about a very small and tiny dosage form, but still in that area of four, six, uh, four, five, six, maybe seven square centimeter, you still have the chance to incorporate up to 100 milligram of API. The application side can also be uh, different. Um, the most popular ones might be the buccal, lingual, or sublingual administration. Of course, there are also further ones possible, like the palatine or the gingiva, but I would say that the buccal, lingual, sublingual form are really the most popular ones. And with, with that, you can modulate the PK profile, for example, using the lingual route, as it would be true for the Listerine pocket packs, you just place it on the tongue. It's a fast disintegration or thin film, and it might be bioequivalent bio to immediate release tablet. So with the goal to have a possibly fast onset of action, but still using typically the classical oral route. On the other hand, you have the sublingual route of administration, which is used typically to achieve a fast onset of action and to increase the bioavailability. And with that, of course, you circumvent the first pass effect by using the transmucosal route. The buccal route, where you place it on the cheek, on the inner part of um, the cheek, you can increase the bioavailability, but typically you do not have that uh, fast onset of action, but maybe a delayed um, uh, release with a reduced CMAX, so more focusing on the um, area under the curve. More looking from a formulation point of view, you can differentiate three types of all thin films. So the one is the most simple one, the fast disintegrate, disintegrating film, which really disintegrates within seconds, typically a single layer and it's based on, on hydrophilic polymers, which can really dissolve very quickly once it gets in contact with the salivar. And with that, you typically achieve a fast onset of action. On the other side, we have that melt away film, which typically disintegrates within minutes, um, one minute, maybe up to five, 10 minutes. It can be a single, layer, but it can also be a multi-layer depending on the need of the of the drug, uh, the drug load, or whether you would like to combine different kind of polymers to adjust the release of the API. In that case, you can also use hydrophilic polymers, but typically they are not that hydrophilic. They still need to be soluble, but uh, you can play with a molecular weight um, of the different kind of polymers, which could be used for such a uh, melt-away film. 
The administration itself is then um, more done by, by a mucous adhesive gel, which is formed uh, once dissolved. So it stays for a longer period of time at the mucosa and is able to release the drug substance. The last one is the buckle film, which can be a slow or even a non-disintegrating film. And that typically disintegrates within less than an hour, 30 minutes to up an hour. It can be even more, but uh, that is a typical range. And that is also typically based on multi-layer films, which is a combination of low soluble or even insoluble polymers. So for example, the outer layer might be an insoluble polymer, which, is, uh, which ensures that the uh, layer stays at the mucosa for a longer period of time. So you really need a mucoadhesive layer to achieve that. And in a, um, for the non-disintegrating films, it's really that you finally should remove that. That is typically not the way we would uh, move forward with such a development as there is always a risk of aspiration, but still it's a possible way. Yeah, and as already explained, uh, you can modulate the plasma profile um, depending on the type of formulation. So with a fast disintegrating film, you achieve that very fast onset of action with a high CMAX. So ideal, for example, for breakthrough pain. Um, on the other hand, you have that melt away film, which is a little bit in between with a lower CMAX, more focusing on the area under, under the curve, still having a quite fast onset of action. On the other hand, we have that slow or non-disintegrating buckle films, which really releases the drug substance over a, a longer period of time, not comparable with the transdermal system where we're typically talking about one day or twice a weekly or even a week. So it's still uh, within a, a shorter period of time, but with that you can, in that area, you can modulate the release of the drug substance quite nicely. So that are the main, they are typical classical uh, all thin film uh, types which are available. But I would like to give you also a brief introduction, introduction into some of our new concepts which are not yet marketed, but which are quite interesting from a technology point of view. So for example, we developed a so-called foam OTF, and it's really quite similar to a foam. So different to the classical or thin film, you can use a broader spectrum of different kind of soluble or insoluble polymers. You can mix that quite well. But before just coating that um, uh, on, in a classical way, you need some kind of, yeah, let's say mixing phase, like, like a, um, an egg whisk, uh, for example, where you can really uh, create just a foam, which can be laminate and, and dried in the next step. And with that, you get a very stable, mechanically stable and robust film which disintegrates very fast. So really within one or up to five seconds, um, depending on the use of the polymers. And it's really quite stable, not only in respect of its mechanically uh, properties, but also in respect of humidity. So it's really robust and you can yeah, um, store that for a long period of time without changing the property of the oral thin film itself. It's soft, it's not sticky, and um, you can place it in all the areas uh, um, in the mouth as it's really very flexible and you can play with the mucoadhesion if you like. And you see here on the left side, uh, three pictures showing the different structure of the uh, um, of this kind of foam showing the porous structure or the distribution of the pore. And you see also that the API is still homogeneously distributed within the all thin film. So that is one 
option, the other one, quite new, is related to a different kind of, of um, technology, which can be ideally used for API printing. So whenever you have to avoid um, a drying process with the API due to the fact that it's um, quite sensible towards um, towards uh, heat, you can use that kind of, of technology. And you see here on the right side that on the upper layer, you have a very porous um, and, and, and soft or thin film surface, but below that you have a more rigid closed structure, which can be then used to print the API in that kind of cavities. Um, and by using different kind of, of mucor adhesion, adhesive uh, polymers, you can also tailor that kind of mucor adhesion quite nicely. So that is something where we believe that that might be of interest, uh, especially for the for the vaccination for the um, by using the transmucosal route, um, and that will be quite interesting to see how that progress within the next months and years. To sum that up, the fascinating all thin films are really um, based on, on a lot of different possibilities to adjust the profile, to improve the bioavailability, to circumvent the first pass effect, to modulate the different PK profiles as, you, uh, as is needed for the certain drug substance, as well as um, the patient compliance, which can be improved quite nicely, which is the reason why we choose that benefits and combine that with the esketamine or thin film to really use the best drug substance or the best um, uh, delivery drug delivery form with esketamine. And that will be part of the next uh, lectures done by Albert as well as by Florian. And with that, I would like to thank you. And um, now I'm open for questions. Okay, there. Hey, hey, Patrick, thanks for your presentation. And uh, I think we have one question. Um, could you uh, ask a question, which OTF you, OTF you would prefer for a high drug load? Uh, principally, the different kind of, of, of um, all thin films can be used. That really depends more on, on the thickness and, and, and how much uh, uh, the drug load will be finally. So you can achieve a quite high drug flux with, with a fast disintegrating film, but also uh, for buckle application. So that is not, not necessarily limited by the, by the use of the polymers, but maybe limited by the uh, plasma profile you finally uh, would like to achieve. And uh, a question from my side, because uh, I have seen the foam samples, which are really great and really nice. But I ask myself sometimes, can we control the bubble sizes and really um, adjust the product that it has really a homogeneous API content? Yeah, sure. I mean, that that is a... Uh, uh, an important question, and 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 yeah, that's of course something which we also studied uh, in our R and D center for, uh, in the analytical department. How to control that, and that really depends on the way how to um, manufacture the the solution and how to per uh, perform the yeah the the part where the foam is really um, formed. And you can also control the drying process afterwards. So finally, yes, that can be controlled and it needs to be controlled to a certain extent to really balance the pore size of each individual film. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for your answers. Uh, I would suggest that we switch now to Albert, um, but if you have any question following to this session, or uh, that just came, came up in, in the next two hours. We will have breakout sessions uh, after the presentations and you can meet Patrick in a private room and uh, ask him the questions directly. 
So thanks, Patrick. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Happy to see you later in the breakout session. Yeah, our next presentation will be done by Professor Dr. Albert Dahan. We were really happy that he is joining us today and uh, gives a talk with us, with our LTS Academy. Um, Albert Dahan is Professor for Anesthesiology at the Leiden University. He's really well known in the pain community um, and really respected for his work. His research fields are novel anesthesia techniques, pain research, and um, the pharmacology of opioids, opioid an antagonists, and of anesthesi uh, anesthetics. So uh, we were really happy that he has designed and conducted the uh, LTS pharmacodynamic study um, on our esketamine OTF. And uh, today he will us, give us a presentation on in pain and the role of ketamine in it. So Albert, it's now yours. It's wonderful to be here, ladies and gentlemen, and I will give an initial presentation on pain and ketamine. And um, indeed, we have been performing the PKPD um, study on the uh, OTF as ketamine. And um, Florian will talk about it a little bit later, but, which I also will comment on that. So let's hope that my presentation comes up. There it is. So I will be talking on pain and ketamine. Um, um, as Iris stated, I'm a professor of anesthesiology and head of the anesthesia and pain research. And I will speak a little bit on um, ketamine in general, but let's first start talking about pain. Pain, as I state here, is highly prevalent in today's society. Um, and if we, first of all, look at post-operative pain, and on the left, you see that um, post-operative pain is prevalent. Um, these scores in white are low pain scores. And when you go up, the pain scores increase. And then you see that about a third of patients, both in the inpatient setting, meaning directly post-operatively, as well as when patients go ho home, are quite high, moderate to severe pain in a third of patients. And we also know that severe pain is associated with the development of chronic pain that you can see on the panel to the right, where you can see that hernia repair, hysterectomy, uh, and thoracotomies, um, they, these patients that undergo these um, surgeries experience pain four months to even two years after surgery. That, that's really relevant to subdue the, the acute pain postoperatively. So severe postoperative pain is associated with chronic pain development. And it's not only for these three indications that I just showed you that chronic, that uh, acute pain is quite severe. Uh, this is a publication from Gerbers Hagen in anesthesiology in 2013. They looked at almost all surgeries and they looked at the cutoff of a pain value of three. They stated, you know, if you have a pain value over three or four, that's severe and that needs to be treated, evidently. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the number of surgeries that indeed have on average, or meet, these are median pain scores and IQRs, interquartile ranges, you can see that the majority of patients, irrespective of surgeries, um, um, uh, lead to patients that have severe pain postoperatively. So it's, it's imminent. It's an really important that we subdue the, this, this, this occurrence of pain and that we treat it adequately. Now, um, what about the development of chronic pain? How many patients in the world are there with chronic pain? Well, first of all, let's have a look on the left side. You can see that the Human Rights Watch stated already several years ago that access to pain relief is an essential human right. And I think that we all agree upon that. But what is most important is that not only there is access to pain relief, but the pain relief is efficacious, that indeed, the, when you dose a patient, that it leads to pain relief. And in terms of chronic pain, I dare to state that 
currently about a third of patients is adequately treated with chronic pain treatments. So that, that's really, really relevant. Um, so the number of patients worldwide with pain, well, the numbers vary. Um, the top states, 40 to 50% of people indicate the presence of chronic pain symptoms over the last year. This is from a US study. In the UE, EU, we think that um, about one in five patients have chronic pain, meaning that doesn't need to be um, continuous pain, but it need, indicates that several days per week, these patients suffer from pain that limits them, limits them in their quality of life, limits them in their work, limits them in their happiness. So that's really important. And if you look at the different countries in the EU, you can see that there is a range from around 10, 12 percent um, to about uh, 30 percent of patients. So on average, I believe that one in five patients suffers from chronic pain. Um, and um, that's a little bit less than the, the U.S. study. So uh, what are the consequences of, of dealing with, with pain? Well, you need to realize that it's prevalent, its treatment is insufficient, as I stated before, and the cost of pain to society is greater than the cost of diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease combined. So we need to treat pain, but, and this is really important, and that's why I'm so happy to be here today to talk about a treatment that might be quite effective, with limited side effects. When you treat your patient, the strategy should always be that you need to consider both efficacy and safety. Because if you don't do that, if you only look at efficacy without the safety in mind, then we, we can take the US as an example. The opioid epidemic started um, because of a prescription um, epidemic, uh, because of severe pain in patients postoperatively that were prescribed, particularly oxycodone, but also other opioids. And the physicians that prescribed these patients did not consider safety issues. So considering safety is really, really important. So how do we currently treat post-operative pain? Well, to, to start out with, it's always a multimodal approach. You, don't, you do not give just one drug. Um, we in our hospital, we, we have ser several options, for instance, paracetamol, in the US it's called acetaminophen. We have the NSAIDs, including metamizole, but you need to realize NSAIDs come with side effects, uh, bleeding is one of them, and several of my surgical colleagues do not want to, um, to, to treat their patients with an NSAID, and especially in the elderly also, NSAIDs are associated with uh, problems with renal function. So most of our patients are prescribed an opioid. Um, in our hospital, it can be morphine, it can be oxycodone. In the US, more prevalently, it's hydromorphone and methadone. We also use fentanyl. But there's also adjuvant therapy. For instance, um, we treat our patients uh, quite often with an alpha-2 agonist like clonidine or IV lidocaine. It's not something that we do, but what we do quite frequently for post-operative pain, because the proof is so high in that respect, I'll come back to that later, is ketamine. Ketamine, both given during surgery as well as post-operatively, is very effective in subduing pain. And there are several other possibilities, for instance, also local blocks, such as epidural or spinal anesthesia. Epidural block can be maintained even postoperatively. So that's a very interesting possibility, but not suitable for all patients. What about chronic pain? And let's focus especially on non-cancer pain. Again, pain treatment is part of a multimodal concept. Um, we start out with non-opioids like paracetamol, NSAIDs, and then you have weak opioids, although in our system, we skip, skip the weak opioids and we go to the stronger opioids. Um, and we like especially the long acting opioids and we restrict the breakthrough uh, pain, um, the, the, the shorter acting opioids for breakthrough pain. So shorter acting, meaning rapid onset, and lasting no longer than 20 to 40 minutes. Of course, there are interventions that are possible. Um, and again, depending on the type, um, there are possibilities of using antidepressants, anti-epileptics, and yet again, ketamine. Ketamine is suitable for treatment of various painful conditions, 
Uh, we use it in our clinic um, for uh, CRPS, but you can use this for neuropathic pain as well. I get back to you later, but also for cancer pain, um, the use of ketamine um, is there, and especially for breakthrough pain. Something I'll discuss a little bit later. Now let's go back to ketamine. Ketamine was first synthesized in the 1960s, as you can see on the top left. Um, it, initially it was uh, marketed and in fact it's developed as an dissociative anesthetic. Well, there's lots of discussion on the term dissociative. Let's just say it's an uh, anesthetic and um, that might cause some psychedelic effects depending on dose um, and depending on co-medication. We don't often see these side effects, um, but they, there are um, patients that suffer from side effects. We need to be quite realistic about that. It was used in Vietnam. It became a drug of abuse. Um, it became a party drug, especially recently in, in Asia and in, in Europe and US, ketamine is abused. Um, we know how it works. It works through the NMDA receptor, but mind, it works on various targets. I will get back to you later. And since the 1990s, we also in our hospital started using it perioperatively as well as for chronic pain uh, treatment. And um, since 2000, I've been involved in ketamine studies. Our, my first publication was in the year 2000. My last was just a couple of uh, days ago on the um, OTF, as ketamine OTF. And that was my 52nd publication on ketamine. So we're doing quite a lot of work on ketamine. What's really, really important is because of its specific characteristics, and ketamine is especially suited for therapy resistant depression. So th this is very, very relevant. It has been um, firstly um, demonstrated by Berman and later published by Zarate. I really believe that's a landmark paper. Um, and we need to realize, as I said before, ketamine uh, works at multiple receptor systems. Um, and um, currently the intranasal esketamine formulation is registered in the US and EU for treatment of therapy resistant depression. The number of publications on uh, um, ketamine has exploded over the last couple of years, as you can see here. And that's not only because of the fact that ketamine is now also indicated in depression, but it's also lots of publication on pain treatment. That's really, really relevant. The pluses here are animal studies, and you can see that the number of animal studies goes down. There's less need for animal studies. There's more need for human studies. Um, there's, we're still doing ketamine studies because ketamine is a very interesting and relevant drug. But it's a complex drug, guys. It's not an easy drug. And there's several issues here. The first one is that it's a racemic mixture. We have S-ketamine and we have R-ketamine. And this racemic mixture um, is, uh, has been used up until recently and still used in various countries like the US for anesthesia and for pain relief. In Europe, especially, but also in the Netherlands, we don't use the racemic mixture anymore. It still exists, but we don't use it and we use the S-ketamine variant. The S-ketamine is one of the isomers of the racemic mixture. And the reason why we uh, skipped using the R-ketamine, this is a publication from um, just several weeks ago from our group in which we showed that R-ketamine um, is quite ineffective in terms of uh, relief of pain. And um, so we could not demonstrate any effect, any contribution of r -ketamine in terms of both pain reduction and these psychedelic side effects. Um, after, for instance, we gave racemic ketamine. So it was just the S isomer that was effective. Um, another problem with ketamine, well, it's not a problem. Um, in fact, it's just an observation, is that ketamine has multiple sequential metabolites. And here you can see that ketamine's first metabolite is norketamine, which can be metabolized to uh, dehydronorketamine, but more importantly, to hydroxynorketamine. And because ketamine is a racemic compound, you can see there are many variants, isomeric variants of the drug. Uh, and of the, the metabolite. And why is this metabolite, this later metabolite, hydroxynorketamine, so important? Because by itself, it's a very potent antidepressant. So 
people are being treated with um, ketamine for depression, but you might uh, argue that we should have a compound that rapidly converts to hydroxynorketamine because it's, this is something I believe and others believe as well. It's hydroxynorketamine uh, part that causes uh, pain relief. Now, this is just to show you that, um, and on the right side, I give you all the possible targets. And this is list is not even complete uh, for ketamine. Well, most importantly, it works at the NMDA receptor. NMDA receptor, I've shown you here to the left, it works at the so called PCP site within the channel. And um, the channel is normally blocked by magnesium. And when the block is lost, for instance, because at the PCP site, ketamine um, interacts with the receptor, the receptor opens up and all kinds, uh, sorry, the receptor is blocked by ketamine. So all these uh, ions cannot move into and out of the cell. So this excitatory um, um, receptor becomes blocked. But as you see on the right, ketamine also acts at opioid receptors, at dopamine receptors, col cholinergic receptors, etc., etc. And even there are indications that uh, ketamine acts at uh, sodium channels. So this is really relevant data. It's not a pure NMDA receptor antagonist. And I believe that part of ketamine's analgesic efficacy is because it works, for instance, on opioid receptors, but also on another receptor, which I didn't show you here, that's the background potassium channel. Now, what is so um, important about ketamine is that it's very um, effective at reducing um, central sensitization of pain. And what is central sensitization? What's first shown by Eric Kandel, the Nobel Prize winner, that if you have two neurons that interact and you give a stimulus to the first neuron, the second one responds. But if you continue to stimulate the system, then you have an, um, an, an inflated or, 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 or a sensitized response. And what we know is that patients that have sensitization of their pain pathways, they respond best to ketamine. So if you have central or even um, segmental sensitization, ketamine is quite effective in subduing pain. And that's what ketamine does. And you can very easily measure um, this, this occurrence of sensitization by performing wind-up using needles. I've shown you that. I'm sorry, you, you cannot really see it well, but I've shown you that here on the right. So um, first summary is there are lots of benefits um, for ketamine. We think theoretically it's an excellent painkiller. It blocks the NMDA receptor, reduces sensitization, exit opioid receptors, etc., etc. And we use it for the treatment of acute and post-operative pain. Um, depending on the indication, we use it for chronic neuropathic pain. And we also use it when we're sure that sensitization is present. And we use it for breakthrough pain also in cancer pain. Now, what about the clinical proof? What we did is we looked at all the meta-analyses and all the systematic reviews that we could find, and we performed a review of these systematic reviews. And the, the, res the results are quite surprising. And I, I um, separated the um, reviews based on the indication. So if we look at acute pain treated in the pre-hospital setting, so this is not perioperative pain. This is, for instance, in the ambulance, a patient that fell down, broke his leg, and treated with ketamine. The majority of the reviews and meta-analysis show that there's absence of evidence. Quite interesting. However, if we look at perioperative use, especially post-operative use of ketamine, then all of these meta-analyses and these reviews show that ketamine is highly effective. It subdues pain. It reduces opioid consumption, and it has very other major uh, effects. For instance, it's anti-inflammatory that benefit the patient. So for post-operative pain, the use of ketamine is very strong evidence. Now, some other indications here. Does it prevent persistent post-operative pain? Well, so far, um, these 1,700 patients that have been looked at, there's absence of evidence. So this is an important observation. Um, also, absence of evidence for chronic non-cancer pain and for chronic or for cancer pain, with the exception, again, for breakthrough pain. So we have certain indications here for ketamine use. So proof 
is there mostly for post-operative pain. But mind you, lack of evidence is not lack of benefit. There is benefit because if we look at open label trials or case series, we do find positive effects, both for cancer pain and for non-cancer pain. And it's related to, in my opinion, the way we perform RCTs for, for pain. Um, and another very, very important observation that what we see in chronic pain treatment often is that the mood of the patient improves significantly. That's one thing. Another issue is that patients feel much better. Not only their mood improves, their pain is also reduced. And because of that, they start act, be, being more active. They start to go out of the house again. They do their shopping, et cetera, et cetera. And their pain again increases, but acceptable to the patient. So rather than looking at pain intensity, one should look at pain, patient satisfaction. And in those terms, um, for these trials, ketamine shows quite high benefit. This is just one example of a study that I performed in chronic neuropathic pain patients treated with ketamine for a long period of time, 100 hours versus placebo, the open circles of placebo. This is the pain score on the left axis, and you can see imminent, almost immediate pain relief. And this is because ketamine almost immediately passes the blood-brain barrier. It reaches the brain within minutes. Um, and the effect lasts for months. So that's also quite important here. Another really, really important observation, and this is very important for post-operative pain relief. We know that opioids suppress breathing, causing sometimes fatal respiratory depression. But what does ketamine do? Well, it stimulates breathing. It causes, the, it, it, it makes breathing more stable. This is what we showed here, and we published that um, some years ago, in which we in fact showed that combining ketamine postoperatively with an opioid improves patient care, not only based on um, the fact that pain relief uh, is improved, that you need less opioids, but breathing has also improved. So that's highly relevant here. So in summary, I've shown you that ketamine is a highly effective drug for the relief of post-operative pain. It reduces opioid consumption. It stabilizes breathing on the right side. There are various indications apart from post-operative pain relief. For example, CRPS pain, neuropathic pain, breakthrough pain in cancer, non-cancer indications. Um, also, outside of the pain uh, world, it is used for various indications, anesthesia, sedation, depression, post-traumatic stress syndrome, epilepsy, bronchospasm, etc. There are some AEs, nausea, it's a mild one. There are some psychomimetic effects that might be expected. Um, I've shown them here, but again, you can treat them with benzodiazepines or alpha-2 agonists. And there's some very um, poorly documented indications of, of toxicity. There are indications when people abuse the drug that there is tissue toxicity, um, but in the hands of physicians, I must say, and especially perioperative use, um, the, the, the probability of toxicity is extremely low. I think this was the last slide. I thank you very much. I'm now open for uh, questions. I hope that there are some questions. So, Albert, uh, I have received a question. I have to read it, so just a second. What do you think about the role of the AMPA receptor regarding pain treatment? Yeah, that's a very important one because when we look at data in animals on uh, hydroxynarcatamine, there is a great publication by Croin in uh, regional, pain regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. I love that publication. Um, and they show that uh, hydroxynorketamine is even more effective um, as a painkiller, and th that drug acts at the AMPA receptor um, than ketamine. So there are indications that it indeed um, is involved in pain relief. So yes, I think there is a place. Although in my studies, um, we could not really find a major effect of it when you compare it to ketamine. It doesn't mean anything. Could be a dosing issue. I haven't given it 
but the, the, the animal data shows that indeed that is possible. Okay. So let's look for the next one. What needs to be done to introduce ketamine in chronic pain? Well, we need more good studies. That needs to be done. Um, and um, although um, there are many studies, what we now should do is primarily we should phenotype patients and only those, those patients that have a phenotype that, for instance, ketamine um, is most effective at. Like I said before, sensitization. If you have a patient with central or segmental sensitization, ketamine might work quite well. If they don't, I wonder about it. Um, so many of the studies that did not do that, and I think 99.99% of studies do not do that, they might fail. And not only for ketamine, by the way, but also for opioids and other indications. So do be better studies and phenotype your patients prior to treatment. Thank you, Albert. I think I have another one. How important are the metabolites of ketamine? Well, personally, I believe very important, depending on the indication. For chronic pain or acute pain, I, especially acute pain, I don't think they're important. Um, but for depression, PTSS, etc., I think they're very important. Um, but again, it's very difficult to test that without having a drug like hydroxynorketamine available for treatment in patients. But I'm convinced that at one point we'll have those drugs and then we can really find out how these drugs work. But for the, the perioperative setting, I don't think they're important. Okay. Okay. So let me just check if I have another one. What do you think about the future or uh, future role of R ketamine? Yeah, I think there's a great role for R ketamine okay. um, in the treatment of depression. Because I really believe that S ketamine is great, it works for depression, but R ketamine is superior. We also we already have some data on that. And um, I'm working now with a company here in the Netherlands that is very interested in that. It's not easy to develop because the market so far doesn't need the drug. But I really believe there is an indication for PTSS, depression, and other um, uh, psychiatric disorders. Okay. I think that were the questions I have received. So thank you very much, Arbet, for your presentation, sure. the questions and everything. And again, also Arbet will be available in our breakout session after the presentations. So thank you, Albert. And let's go to our clinical study. Um, yeah, my colleague Florian Hammes, uh, he's pharmacist and joined LTS in 2010. He is working in the group of Patrick uh, and he is heading the s project. So he will present the results of the, our clinical studies on our esketamine OTF. So Florian, it's now your turn. Yeah, thanks a lot for your introduction, Aris. I hope I can see my presentation in a few minutes. Yeah, okay, here it is. I would like to take the opportunity to talk to you about uh, the clinical study results with our esketamine OTF. First of all, I would like to give you some considerations about the objective of our project and the clinical study. As already known, ketamine is an NMDR receptor antagonist authorized as an anesthetic and antidepressant drug. It is used off-label by physicians for many years for the treatment of pain. Currently, the intravenous route is the predominant form of ketamine delivery with inherent need for a sterile venipuncture by skilled healthcare personnel, and there is an imminent need for an alternative route of ketamine administration for the pain treatment. Esketamine is twice as potent as a racemic mixture and offers the possibility to reduce dose-depending side effects, mainly psychoactive, um, psychoactive ones, especially immediately after the administration, which limits the use of ketamine in pain treatment. Objective of LTS is to develop a transmucosal oral film for the treatment of acute post-operative pain as an alternative to opioids and opioids-tolerant patients. 
On this slide, um, I summarize some known ketamine benefits regarding the treatment of pain. Ketamine offers the potential for the treatment of moderate to severe pain conditions. It can be an alternative for opioid tolerant patients with acute and chronic tolerance. With ketamine, it's possible to reduce the opioid consumption combined with less opioid side severe effects, which is an unmet need in pain management. And with ketamine, it's um, possible to have a dose sparing effect. Ketamine can also reduce hyperalgesia. And with ketamine, you can broaden the overall armamentarium of the limited pain treatment options. Compared to opioids, ketamine has a high lethal dose. Our S-ketamine OTF could improve the acute pain therapy through a rapid, rapid onset and sustained pain relief in an acute phase, combined with mild psychomimetic side effects and minor adverse events. The um, OTF offers a non-parental route of administration with an ease of administration combined with increased sublingual bioavailability. And with an OTF, you will have an advantageous administration in hospital environment. And I also mentioned before, ketamine could be an alternative to opioid treatment in the severe conditions of acute pain. Um, the OTF use for our clinical study has a total dose of 50 milligram regarding to the free base of S-ketamine. The OTF size was 4.5 square centimeter. And for our OTF, we have a full disintegration with the disintegration time below 60 seconds. And the target shelf life of our OTF is at least 24 months. Primary objective of our performed clinical study was to determine the pharmacokinetic profiles of an um, esketamine oral thin film with a dosing of 50 milligram or 100 milligram esketamine. And for the 100 milligram dosing group, we used two 50 milligram esketamine OTFs. Secondary objective was to determine the pharmacodynamic profile of our esketamine OTF with 50 and 100 milligram dosing with the endpoints antinociception and psychomimetic side effects with three different pain models. Additionally, we determined the safety and tolerability of the esketamine oral syn film. Our clinical study had an exploratory open label crossover and randomized study design. All study, study subjects were treated twice. Once they received 50 milligram esketamine OTF, and once I received 100 milligram S-ketamine OTF in the random order, 15 subjects received the OTF sublingually and five other subjects received the OTF buccally. And in the study population, 20 healthy volunteers were involved. On this slide, you can see the plasma profile for S-ketamine after the dosing of 50 milligram and 100 milligram S-ketamine OTF. In the green color, you can see the plasma profile for the 50 milligram dosing group. And in the red color, you can see the plasma profile for the 100 milligram dosing group. And for the evaluation of the oral bioavailability, we use after 360 minutes, an intravenous dose of 20 milligram given over 20 minutes. And the plasma profile you can see here after 360 minutes. For the 50 milligram dosing group, we have the PK results for 19 subjects. And for the 100 milligram dosing group, we have the PK results for 20 subjects. As you can see here, <clears throat> we have for our OTF a fast onset of action with the Tmax value with around about 90 minutes. And the available data show that we have a nonlinear. PK dose dependency for our OTF. And on the basis of the available data for the um, intravenous administration, the OTF bioavailability was estimated for our OTF with 29%. Additionally, to the measure plasma profiles for S ketamine, we measured the plasma profiles for the active metabolites S norketamine and has S hydroxy norketamine and also the plasma profiles for the metabolites after the IV administration. For the OTF, we have a high metabolism rate to the active metabolites after the OTF administration, 
And also here you can see that available data sh show a nonlinear non -linear PK dose dependency for our OTF. And compared to the IV administration of trench milligram, we have really high plasma levels for the active metabolites. For the evaluation of the analgesic effect of our OTF, we use three established um, pain models. We use the pressure pain model, the electrical pain model, and the heat pain model. And you can see on the basis of the available data that our OTF is analgesic in all three pain models with effects lasting from two to six hours. The onset of pain relief is rapid with peak effects within 30 to 45 minutes. And none of the used pain models are clear those, um, those response relationship becomes apparent. For all three tested pain models, the effect of doubling the dose of the OTF did not produce a significant increase in anti-snotic subception. For the evaluation of psychedelic side effects after the administration of 50 and 100 milligram esketamine OTF, we use the bottle questionnaire and bond letter questionnaire. Um, regarding on the re available results, we have a dose dependency, which is apparent with the greatest effects on the drug high feeling, followed by internal perception, and little effects were observed on the external perception. The 100 milligram esketamine OTF dosing group had a significant effect on the mental state of subjects, causing vertigo and dizziness. And the reported psychedelic side effects were very mild for the 50 milligram dosing group. For our OTF, um, the adverse the reported adverse events were minor, and the adverse events um, related predominantly to the intravenous infusion of esketamine. No serious adverse event was reported. For our OTF, no mucosa irritation was um, reported after the administration. And with the use sweetener and flavoring agent for our OTF, an acceptable, acceptable taste masking was confirmed. And also the ease of administration with the good, good mouth feeling was also confirmed. On the basis of the available um, data, we can conclude that our clinical study was successful, successfully completed. The data set indicates that we have a nonlinear dose dependent increase in the concentration of esketamine and metabolites. For our OTF, we have a rapid onset and sustained pain relief in acute phase. Reported adverse events were minor and related predominantly to the intravenous infusion of esketamine. And regarding the lack of dose dependency in pain relief, it is intriguing and may be related to the high concentrations of the metabolite s norketamine after the OTF administration that may have an analgesic effect. Due to the high concentrations of the metabolite m s hydroxy norketamine after OTF administration due to the large first pass effect or due to the metabolism in the mucosa of the mouse, the esketamine OTF could also be attractive for the treatment of um, indications such therapy resistant depression or post traumatic stress disorder. And for the next slide, I will pass you over to my colleague Albert. And Albert will give you some information about our results regarding the population pharmacokinetic analysis. Well, thank you, Florian. Um, well, you see here that we performed, well, we, we constructed a uh, pharmacokinetic model of the data in which we were able to simultaneously analyze the intravenous and the OTF application. And we had an, uh, on the left side, we had a uh, ketamine part, we had a me meta metabolism part, um, we had a norketamine part, yet again, a metabolism part, and then hydroxy norketamine part. And what's so interesting here is that we were able to, to um, discriminate between the OTF um, absorption through the mucosa. As well, we were able to calculate um, the fact that part of the ketamine was transported to the GI tract, because you need to realize the OTF was placed for 10 minutes in the mouth. Only then 
was the subject able to swallow? So they were not allowed to swallow for the first 10 minutes. And in these first 10 minutes, 30% of the drug was absorbed um, um, as ketamine via the mucosa. Then a large part, 70%, was transported to the GI tract, where either it was then uh, taken up um, in the portal vein and transported to the liver, where it was metabolized into uh, the metabolites, or, and that's something that, that's not unimportant, we also believe that there was some um, metabolism either in the mucosa of the mouth, uh, sublingually, or in the gut. We were not able to, to, um, to differentiate between these three, gut mucosa, oral mucosa, or liver per se, but it's quite interesting. But what I find really interesting here is that we have very high levels of metabolites. And if, you, if there is at one point the need for a drug, um, for ketamine's metabolites, for a drug that, that causes lots of metabolites, I think that hydroxynorketamine is, is a very interesting, um, uh, sorry, that the OTF is a very interesting possibility here. I think let me stick to this. The publication is already available on the web um, because it has been published recently in Frontiers in Pain Medicine, um, in Pain Research, I have to say, and it's uh, freely available. Back to you, Florian. Thanks a lot, Albert. Yeah, this brings us to the end of my presentation and I hope there are some questions regarding the clinical study results. Thank you, Florian, uh, for your presentation. And we have received several questions. So I would start to ask, uh, are randomized control trials with statistically significant re results in favor of ketamine for the palliative treatment of cancer pain? Albert, perhaps you can answer this question. But the, major the majority does not find a positive effect but then they did not really um, pinpoint towards breakthrough pain. So if you look at the whole um, the, the, you know, pain by itself, pain induced by the cancer, um, it was never ever better than just uh, morphine. Um, so when you restrict your analysis to breakthrough pain, then you will see a, a benefit. And the OTF, in my opinion, especially um, indicated for such an, uh, um, an, a form of pain, breakthrough pain. You need rapid onset and not too long effect. So an effect of, let's say, two hours is, 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 is perfect. Thank you, Albert. So next question. Uh, for 100 milligram, did you use uh, two films of 50 milligrams? Yes. For the 100 milligram dosing group, we used um, two films of 50 milligram, and yes, and they were applied simultaneously. Okay, thanks. So, what is the concrete lethal dose of ketamine compared to opioids? Yeah, I think compared uh, to the literature, the lethal dose is around about three grams. Is that correct, Albert? I think so. I think so too. Um, it, it's very resistant, um, this drug, to um, severe side effects. In fact, when you, there's one issue. If you use it for multiple times in a row uh, at very high dose, you will have cardiorespiratory depression um, because of the fact that cardiac stimulation is due to sy sympathetic effects of ketamine. So very useful, for instance, in trauma conditions. But if you keep doing that, but th these are major uh, dosages and they're not used clinically at all. <clears throat> so there's no fear for death compared to opioids, not at all. Okay, uh, thanks Albert. Perhaps you can just stay with us if yes. we have additional <laughs> questions for you. Uh, I come up with the next one. What is the reason for not having a dose-dependent plasma profile? Difficult. Uh, yeah. I was a li little bit surprised, uh, Florian. I'd expected some. Um, yeah, um, is there a saturation in the absorption? Um, that that would surprise me. Um, I, I just don't know why that was. Yeah, um, regarding our research paper, we have um, the PK and um, PK population analysis, and we we cannot see 
why we have no effect doubling the size. That's yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, coming back to the two films that we applied for the yeah. hundred milligrams. Um, did you apply to sublingually or vocally in the bu buccal cavity at a, at the same time or, or one yes, after the other? At the same time. So they are placed uh, in parallel. In okay. parallel, yes. Okay. Um, what is the reason for using these three pain models? Well, to be honest, um, you can use any pain model. We have lots of experience with this, and these pain models are very um, effective in, in, in for opioids. And so, especially the pressure pain, the first one is very effective here as well. And we have a whole set of, of data from intravenous ketamine um, with these models, so we could easily compare it. Okay. Thank you, Albert. What type of OTS was used? A single layer, fast disintegration? Yes, so single layer, single layer formulation, fast, fast disintegrating type. Yes. So, did you uh, already know when you started developing that this will the type uh, of of choice, or was yes, it a... for our purpose because of the high drug loading? We use this film formulation. Okay. What was the reason for choosing twenty milligram IV dose of ketamine? That's also an important one because you can use any dose, but it has to be acceptable to the patient. And we had one patient of, of volunteers in this case, we had one volunteer that after 20 milligrams um, did not want to participate any, anymore because of the side effects. She liked the OTF quite well, 100 milligram, but she didn't like the 20 milligrams IV. So you cannot go too high because then you will lose all of your sub subjects because of side effects. IV ketamine, produces much more intense side effects than what we've seen here. Realize that. So this is a much easier preparation, much easier dosing of volunteers. So um, yeah, the, the dose is based on our experience and the fact that we didn't want to go too high up. Okay. Thank you, Albrecht. Uh, a question about the bioavailability for OTF. Have you ever found a reduced C-max and higher T-max because of food effect in case of a poor soluble API? Um, I'm sorry, but I have no information regarding this issue, but perhaps Patrick, you have some information about this? So good, we have so many experts here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, I hope you are still online. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Now I'm back. Um, oh, that's actually a good question. Um, have you ever found a reduced Cmax and higher Tmax because of food effect? I mean, if if we're talking about poor soluble drugs, um, it, it it's always the question whether, yeah, how long will it really stay in the oral cavity, and that is sometimes quite tricky as of course a certain portion of the api will be swallowed uh, if it's not uh, dissolved so in that case it might happen that um, uh, a reduced cmax could be seen but um, for those candidates or let's say for those apis which are really a little bit faster in the, or, or um, uh, close to to um, to the market entry or already on the market. Uh, to my understanding, that was not observed so far. Okay, thank you, Patrick. We have just more questions. Did you measure the drug high effect for the injection part as well? No, for the IBA administration, we have no data for the drug high feeling. No, but we know it from other studies and you can go up to 100. So we saw about half of the effect that you would expect um, if you would give a similar dose um, intravenously. Okay, thanks. Uh, what was the reason for choosing a time frame of six hours between OTF and injection? None. <laughs> the reason was to get as low a dose of the OTF as possible. Um, and we, we in, you know, before we started the study, we had no idea how long the OTF would last, also pharmacodynamically. So it was a, a um, yeah, a guess, I have to say. But it worked out quite well. Yeah. 
sometimes you're lucky. Yeah. Well, hey. I'm a great study. Thank you, uh, Albert. So I think last question so far, you can still put questions on if you like, we have a little bit more time, but uh, last one I see is, do you see a benefit and a benefit of using a sublingual route towards a buccal route or vice versa? Yes, um, in this study, we use both administration routes and um, on the available data, we cannot state that there is a big difference between the this and route. But um, I think for our OTFs, the sublingual is the preferred one. Okay. So I don't see any additional questions. So I would say thank you, Florian. Thank you, Albert. Um, so we can switch to our next speaker, which is uh, Dr. May Pidding. She is uh, director of our business development in the US. Um, May earned her bachelor de degrees of, in biology from the University of Boston, went uh, on to gradu graduate school on the University of California, San Diego, and received her PhD in biomedical sciences. Uh, May is with us since 2021 and focuses on our customers in North America. May will now talk about uh, a little bit about LTS, our business model, and the market of pain and espidamine. So, May, please go ahead. Thanks, Iris, um, and great to be here. Great to have listen to the interesting presentations on esketamine and uh, its role in pain, um, controlling pain after operations. And what I'm going to do is give you a little bit more background on LTS, the company, um, the market for pain in the US and worldwide, and also give you a little more information on the licensing and partnering opportunity for the esketamine OTF. So if you could please put up my slides, there, I, there it is. So LTS is a cooperation partner. This is me. And if you're interested in contacting me, that is my contact information. So as many of you know, LTS is the leading global partner of the pharmaceutical industry in transdermal therapeutic systems and oral thin films. We have a, over 1,150 employees currently Last year, we had revenues of about 300 million euros. We took about 9% of that and put that back into our R&D department. We had expenditures or investments of about 15 million euros in CapEx. We have over 200 patent families. We produced over 700 million systems last year between OTFs and TTS. We currently have over 30 cooperation projects ongoing. And between our two uh, manufacturing sites, we have over 60,000 square meters of production area. Now, regarding those two manufacturing sites, our worldwide headquarters is in Andernach, Germany, which is about a, an hour away from Frankfurt. This is not only a manufacturing site, but also our global research and development um, departments are held here for all of our delivery technologies. I am currently sitting at our manufacturing site in West Caldwell, which produces products, commercial products for the US market primarily. And we also have a business office in Shanghai, China. So LTS's primary business model is business to business. We are a CDMO. We are a contract development and manufacturing organization producing and developing commercial products for the pharma industry we do not market any of those products. So as you saw in Patrick's presentation, we have been manufacturing, for example, Listerine pocket packs for over 20 years now um, for our partner, but you will not see LTS's name anywhere on there. And that's just an example of, of us not marketing any of our products, uh, any of the products that we produce. We are a full service provider, so we can have partners and customers come to us and say, we have an interesting a new chemical entity, or we have an API that we would like to repurpose into an oral thin film or a transdermal patch, 
or perhaps they would like to try to see if it could be incorporated into our microarray patches. So we can do formulation development and analytical R&D. We also have customers that come to us and say that we have done some work on a lab bench and we would like for you to uh, develop that and, and be able to scale that up into quantities where we can put that those quantities into a clinical trial. Um, upon successful clinical studies, we can also be the provider of commercial supplies for the customer. And we also provide primary and secondary packaging if that's a need as well. So as I mentioned, and this is a, a slide that Patrick had as well, we are a CDMO and technology provider, and we have a few different drug delivery technologies in the oral thin films and transdermal therapeutic systems, as well as our microarray patches, which is an emerging delivery technology. Um, as mentioned, we our primary business model is business to business as a CDMO, but like um, we've been describing uh, for the past couple of hours, we also develop our own internal programs, which we hope to then develop to a certain stage and partner that out to um, interested parties. So changing gears a little bit into specifically esketamine and its role and potential in the post-operative pain arena. Um, esketamine, as previously mentioned, is registered for general anesthesia, but physicians have been using it for as an off-label treatment for post-operative pain for decades. Approximately 50 million surgeries are performed each year in the U.S. and in the five biggest EU states. This market is predicted to grow 4.7% from 2021 to 2026. And globally, the market of narcotics used in pain treatment was $8.9 billion in 2020. However, since the start of the opioid crisis, prescription of the top opioid sellers, fentanyl and oxycodone, have significantly decreased. So LTS um, saw that as an opportunity to take uh, esketamine see if we could put it into an oral thin film and you saw all of the history behind that as well as the clinical trial. Uh, because we saw that there's per perhaps an innovative product profile specifically designed for use of esketamine in an unsaturated growing market. And as mentioned before, an alternative to opioid treatment um, and to remedy the opioid crisis in the US We've seen from Florian and Albert that uh, we there is a, a rapid onset for pain relief that, that lasts a bit of time um, with very mild psychomimetic effects and minor adverse events. And as mentioned, non-parental route of administration, there's an ease of just putting um, this film into your mouth and leaving it on your tongue. Um, so in a hospital environment, that's quite advantageous. As you saw, it's technically well-designed and there's low development risk. So what is this partnering opportunity? As you saw, we had we have completed a pilot study showing rapid acting pain relief with different pain models and low, uh, very minor adverse events and very mild psychomimetic effects. A regulatory route via 505B2 with commercial launch for 2027 is targeted. LTS has filed patent applications on this esketamine OTF composition. So um, the IP is protected and the territory available is worldwide. So now what? So um, we have done a lot of this work. Like I said, we are a, a commercial development manufacturing organization, but we take on some internal projects to develop them to a certain point. And so the next step would be to partner with perhaps somebody out in the audience to um, fund the next steps for scale up and um, clinical uh, next clinical phases. So to illustrate that a little bit, LTS has done the theoretical feasibility and the practical feasibility, as well as formulated um, the OTF with the S-ketamine. And we did a proof of concept study. What we're talking about here is having a partner come in and license this asset from LTS and then to fund the final product development and then um, going back to our CDMO roots to have LTS perform 
these, these steps. And those steps would include development of a final market image, ICH stability studies, clinical trial material supplies for further needed clinical studies, process development and validation, and preparation of CMC submission document. And so going back to LTS as a company, why would you, why would you fund this and then have LTS perform um, the studies? Well, as mentioned, we are a preferred partner for the pharma industry. We have over 30 years of successful registration history with all of the major regulatory bodies. We also have a narcotic license. With our two sites in Europe and in West Caldwell, New Jersey, we have a strategic supply security in that both plants are equivalent in their commercial uh, manufacturing configurations, um, giving us the world's largest manufacturing capabilities for transdermal patches and oral thin films. We have a broad technology base. We have experienced R&D teams, as you probably saw with Florian and, and Patrick there. Um, and as shown, we are a full service provider. So not only can we take this, and we have taken it from um, formulation development, but it's a seamless transfer for, from those R&D labs through scale up and then commercial manufacture. And, uh, you know, proof is of the pudding. We have proven ability to deliver more than 20 different commercial products over the years. And so with that, I thank you all for your attendance. And um, Iris, any, anything from your side? Thank you very much, May, for the introduction to LTS and our business model. Um, and we have decided that we don't have a Q and A after yours, after your presentation, but you will be open to discuss everything in person uh, during the breakout session. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us and to listen to our presentations. As I told you, we will now, our speakers will now go in different breakout rooms and breakout sessions. If I understood the technique correctly, you have to go back to the platform and on the left hand menu, you will find a link to enter the breakout session. And then you can choose your, uh, disc, your partner with, with whom you would like to discuss. I say, say again, thank you very much. You can connect with LTS anytime with, uh, by writing us an email on info at ltsloman.com or by going over our LinkedIn account, which is LTS Lohmann. So I would be happy if you contact us or one of the speakers and say thank you for listening. So see you in the breakout sessions. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.